Lindsay Whaling was driving through Cessnock this morning when a person in a passing car threw a bottle out of the window, smashing his windscreen. Well, I had to go to the council chambers this morning and I sort of came out the door and uh, the police were just there on the spot, so very convenient. Yeah. Constable Scott Savage was outside the Cessnock council chambers, about to launch his community-based policing program. That's the sort of things that we want the police down here and people know that we're in certain places they can call in and give us that information instead of having to come up to the police station where a lot of people fear that uh, they're going to be victimised or branded as dobbers as we call it. One day a week, constables will be stationed at designated places such as shopping centres and libraries. Well, we might have uh, people from a, with a criminal element necessarily might want to come up and talk to us and I think we fully understand that. But uh, they're the sort of people that maybe that we're trying to stop the crime from occurring within the Cessnock community. If the scheme is well received by the public, the presence of constables in the area will be increased. Jane Anderson, NBN News. This is another face of the economic recession. These foals were left without food and water after a bank foreclosed on a stud owner in the Upper Hunter. The RSPCA was called in when there was simply no money to keep the animals alive. The RSPCA is receiving 50 animals a month, mostly from distraught owners who are stretched to the limit. They simply admit, if you like, um, that, that times are too tough financially, they cannot uh, keep this animal any longer. Those found to be mistreating animals could face a six-month jail term plus a $2,000 fine. Stock owners are warned to sell off their animals before it's too late. And for those looking to buy a new pet, a hard piece of economic advice. Budget uh, for it. Budget for your veterinary expenses and for the feed and care that is necessary for these animals. Police were called to the Caltech service station on the Pacific Highway at Sandgate last night. A 40-year-old male attendant had been menaced with a spear gun and forced to open the cash register. The bandit, described as being 175 centimetres in height, wearing dark clothing, a balaclava and reflective sunglasses, escaped with the afternoon's takings, running through the nearby cemetery. His description and the use of a small and potentially lethal spear gun matches that of another hold-up at an SO service station a kilometre away last week. So far, no one has been injured, but police fear the offender could strike again. We certainly hope not. Uh, with, if we get information from the public that can lead to an early arrest, we, uh, we'll be able to nip it in the bud as soon as possible. In an unrelated hold-up at Madawi last night, her storekeeper was robbed in the car park of a shopping centre. The owner of Plaza Video had shut shop and was heading home with his earnings. The video store owner was about to unlock his vehicle when he was confronted by a gunman who'd been hiding on the other side. A shortened firearm was pointed directly at his head and the gunman demanded he hand over the takings and his wallet. The offender ran off into the dark and is thought to have escaped in a car. Police are searching for a man 180 centimetres in height. He was wearing a black jumper and jeans, a balaclava and ski mask. It's an annual problem for Newcastle students, a severe shortage of on and off campus accommodation. Just 2.7% of the uni population can be housed on campus, compared with 30% at the Australian National University and 105 at Wollongong. 
But instead of just lobbying for more funding, the students have come up with a different solution. Revitalise or restore some of the old buildings in Newcastle by getting private developers or state or federal government in and um, investing some money into, into the old buildings and, and using them, um, developing, developing them for student accommodation. Tony Hansen says the average student could afford around $70 a week. Put three or four people together and the total rental return would be comparable to most city units. The idea could also kill two birds with one stone, relieving the accommodation crisis and injecting life into the ailing CBD. If you put students living in, in these uh, old, old buildings, it's going to re revitalise the city by having people live there and also economically revitalise the city by, by having demand there for services and goods. Newcastle Lord Mayor John McNaughton has put his weight behind the proposal and will call a public meeting to discuss the plan with government and business leaders. I believe there are ways of structuring it so that it is a profitable venture and uh, uh, I think it can be done and, uh, but it's certainly worth looking at and that's what we're doing at the moment. Alif Richmond was born in Tasmania in 1919 and died in 1977. He was known as a sculptor, but between 1937 and 1948 he served in the Australian Army and the only artistic tools at his disposal were a simple pen and paper. During the Second World War he sketched many of the people and scenes around him. In 1948 he moved to London and lived there for the rest of his life. So this exhibition is a rare glimpse of the work of his early career in Australia. Because he did most of his work in England, uh, the sculpture hasn't made its way back to Australia and these drawings are some of the few works of his that are in the country. When Premier Nick Greiner announced his new cabinet yesterday, it wasn't just the faces that had changed, there's also some new and controversial reworkings of portfolios. The old Department of Minerals and Energy has been split, the minerals component is now in the Natural Resources portfolio, and Robert Webster is the Minister for Planning and Energy. What this restructuring means for the Hunter's mining industry, the unions aren't too sure yet. Well, first impressions to me are that certainly it's abnormal. Uh, it hasn't happened um, in the life, I think, of either Labor or Conservative governments. And I'd, have, I'd be seeking a meeting with the government to find out what they're on about. One new face in the Griner Cabinet is Upper Hunter member George Souris, whose duties will include assisting the Premier with privatising Elcom. The Miners' Federation, which is opposed to the selling off of Elcom, has sent a letter to Mr Souris today calling for a meeting to find out where each other stands on the privatisation issue. The whole Elcom structure has been proven to be uh, profitable and viable uh, for a number of years and still is. Although Mr Souris only joined the Cabinet yesterday, he said he's well aware of the concerns of coal miners about privatisation and has agreed to a meeting with the Federation. The changes to the environment portfolio have been slammed by conservation groups. Ian McKenzie from the Newcastle branch of the Wilderness Society says the National Parks and Wildlife Service has been dismembered and that could have ramifications for the hunter. The Newcastle branch of the Wilderness Society is very close now to putting in a wilderness nomination for the Barrington Tops Wilderness. Uh, with this new arrangement we really don't know where we stand and for the moment we're not going to uh, put that nomination in. Scott Bevan, MBN News. The school bus was carrying children and three adults from the Belmont Baptist Christian School to their home south of Swansea at about 3.15 when it collided with a sedan which apparently lost control in the wet. A fleet of ambulances ferried the primary school youngsters to Wyong Hospital. Relieved rescuers found that none had suffered serious harm. Uh, they're only suffering slight cuts and abrasions. One bloke's got a pain up the top of his leg but that's all. 
The driver of the sedan, a 52-year-old man, was trapped for about half an hour. It's believed he suffered fractures to the ribs and legs. He was airlifted to John Hunter Hospital aboard an emergency helicopter which is standing in for the Westpac Lifesaver Rescue Helicopter undergoing a service in Sydney. The smash was on a notorious bottleneck of the Pacific Highway and police were forced to divert traffic for more than two hours as salvage crews cleared the debris. We've only got heavy traffic coming up here. We've put all the light stuff over scenic drive but at this stage we've got a heap of heavy stuff to come through. Heavy traffic was beginning to move through the scene at about 5.30 this evening. At this year's Gem Craft and Treasure Expo all that glitters is not gold. It could be pyrite or quartz or amethyst or virtually any other glittering prize that can be dug up. Almost 150 exhibitors have assembled at the Newcastle showgrounds to attract those whose enthusiasm for minerals is rock hard, as well as those who merely wish to fossick for a gem of a bargain. Visitors can buy a piece of rough rock, have it polished and set at the exhibition stalls. One stone that would make quite an impression on the ring finger is this opal that organisers say is worth five million dollars. Co-organiser Graham Kessing says these millions of stones under one roof add up to a pile of money. It would be in excess of a thousand million dollars. How did you arrive at that figure? Well, a one carat faceted stone is a very small stone and going on the thousands, millions, millions of them that are here at the show and all the vintage and historic cars and all the other collections and hobbies that are here, um, which has never been a mass like this before anywhere in Australia. What's the attraction? Hamish Shelford wished he'd never set foot on the ISC, out for the count after some heavy Knights defence early in the first half. Gordon kicked a penalty for the Knights, and then they really put the pressure on Lydiard and Stokes. But Stokes made amends with a big fend on Gordon. For all and right on half time, Glenn Miller and Cliff Lyons were involved in an altercation which resulted in both players spending 10 in the bin. On the resumption, the Knights were reduced to 11 men as Hoogerworth was sent to the bin. But then the Knights poured on the pressure and Schuster went awfully close to giving the home team the lead. A metre out from their own line, live wire Jeff Toovey scored one of the tries of the season. Forced to counter-attack, the Knights finally crossed wide out to level at eight all. And with only a couple of minutes remaining, money man Ashley Gordon was right on target. Final score, Newcastle nine, Manly eight. Over 2,500 netballers have been taking part in the championships on a round-robin format, with each team playing 16 matches. Borkham Hills continued their amazing run of success, winning the under-17 title, remaining undefeated in their age group since beginning in the state titles five years ago. Eastwood Ride were victorious in the under-19s, Manly Warringah in the 21s, and the City of Sydney won the Open Minor Crown. As expected in the Open, Manly, Ramwick and Sutherland fought out the championship, and it was Manly who proved too good for the opposition. This afternoon they accounted for Ramwick 24-18 and then in the final match turned in a super performance against Inform Sutherland. 
It was close all match, for the experience of Manly got them home in a thriller 22-12, the scoreline no indication of the quality of the match. Rain. There's been up to 100 millimetres of it in parts of the Hunter in the past 24 hours. Almost all sporting events were cancelled. Still, it didn't stop some from enjoying the great outdoors. Thousands of others spent a drier holiday, pouring hard-earned cash into retailers' pockets. Most department stores reported a steady day's trading. Outside, a few brave souls battled on. You know, there's an old saying that this is lovely weather for ducks, and here's proof. Unfortunately, everybody else thought so. The contrasting elements, fire and water, combined to interrupt trading at Newcastle Tats Club. The earthquake-damaged premises were not able to properly resist a torrent of rainwater which leaked into the building yesterday morning. Trade was temporarily suspended. Then after midnight, water found its way into one of the club's fuse boxes. It caused a short circuit and started a fire. As far as the actual smoke damage and fire damage uh, to the club itself, there is nil. It is in mainly in the main power boxes that has caused all the problem. We have no power, although just at the moment we have, but for how long we don't know. The main damage, however, was to the normally prosperous long weekend trade. We lost all our trade from our, our poke machines, our bar and the bingo today, and plus uh, a holiday weekend, which is normally a good day for us on a Monday, has all ceased uh, with no money coming in whatsoever. It's a dead, da it's a dead day for the last two days for us. The Newcastle Tats Club will remain closed until repairs are completed. Jane Anderson, NBN News. Rescue teams are on standby tonight to evacuate people and belongings if watercourses rise further. Already 21 people have died on the nation's roads over the weekend, but there were no further fatalities reported today. And the weather has caused havoc off the coast, with three vessels coming to grief off Port Stephens and at least one other to the north. Friends today continue to search for a 45-year-old man missing since yesterday. The state government says it aims to stamp out sick leave rorts by banning its accumulation as part of a package of legislation likely to be introduced at the end of the August budget session of Parliament. Overseas, thousands of US servicemen and their families stationed at the Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines have fled from a rumbling volcano, Mount Pinatubo, in a long convoy of cars and vans. While our Foreign Minister, Gareth Evans, has called for a relaxation of security on his visit to South Africa after a run-in with police during a visit to black townships. No runway lights, airport navigation aids switched off, no one responding to radio messages. This was our first hint of what a country in revolution is like. But here, despite the ease of entry, the Army of Liberation was not welcomed with open arms. However much their hatred of Mengistu, to many people in the capital, the EPRDF, made up of mainly Tigrayan soldiers from the north, was like an occupying army. We talked to many who resented their presence. Another key move by the EPRDF was to take over state television and radio, issuing nightly messages of reassurance to the population. 
and despite manifesto promises of a free press, foreign TV journalists were subjected to censorship, as we found on Saturday. We'd filmed one of the worst sights we'd ever seen, a devastated munitions factory in which hundreds of people died. This was four days after the plant exploded while being looted, yet the charred bodies remained unburied, rotting. The stench was overpowering. Shocked families could not even tell whether or not their loved ones were victims. <laughs> The scene of carnage here is utterly unimaginable. This pile of rubble here was once one of the main munitions buildings. Witnesses say when it was blown up in the explosions, hundreds of people were buried beneath. But we were not allowed to transmit our report and pictures. The censor said we failed to make it clear it was an accident. A week after the rebel takeover, the capital had been returning to normal. It seemed to us the new regime was being accepted. And then, Tuesday's sabotage attack on an ammunition dump was a shocking reminder that there are still many determined to destabilize the new regime. The fear is that such terror tactics may push the EPRDF towards authoritarianism and intolerance. Tension was back. The new government's challenge now to keep control without resorting to the brutal methods of its predecessors. Bob Brown's outburst will rub salt into the wounds of a government still trying to restore the credibility of its leader. It will also damage attempts to patch what the public sees as gaping holes in party unity. Mr Brown objects to plans to hand over federal funds for road and transport projects to the states. That would give them the responsibility and the political mileage for how, when and where those programs are implemented. There was a, a move towards not only identifying more clearly the relative responsibilities between, say, state and federal government, but a tendency at the same time to provide federal funds on federal programs which then would be administered and determined at state level. And I didn't believe that was appropriate. And if Bob Brown has his way, the ranks of those opposing the Prime Minister's plans will grow. I'm seeking uh, the endorsement of my caucus colleagues, which I have no doubt at all I'll get. I'll also uh, receive the endorsement of uh, ministers in Cabinet to ensure that uh, the Federal Government maintains a significant presence in the area of land transport development. Alison Peters, NBN News. Just a week after Nick Greiner claimed victory in one of the state's closest elections, Industrial Relations Minister Fay has sent the union movement into convulsions. Again, it's, uh, it's the sledgehammer approach, uh, no consultation. Uh, we're the government and uh, we'll approach these issues as we see fit. The government says rorts in the sick leave system are costing billions. It's called for the accumulation of sick leave from year to year to be stopped. Local government has been targeted as the greatest offender. Workers at Newcastle Council have their unused sick leave added on annually. Retiring from the job, they can be paid out 75% of their sick leave entitlements. At Shortland Electricity, workers can leave with a payment for 100% of their accumulated sickies. After 20 years' service, that's equivalent to another year's wages. The average blue-collar worker doesn't get the payout but can save up sick days to guard against long-term illness. But according to the Trades Hall Council, if that right of accumulated sickies is removed, it'll open the floodgates for workers to take every sick day every year. If they don't take that leave, they'll lose it altogether. If it's there and uh, workers feel that it's threatened, uh, then I think it's a big inducement for them to take, them, take it regardless. Even the Newcastle Chamber of Commerce has questioned the government's approach. I think the proper place to address this particular proposed uh, legislation is in the Industrial Commission and perhaps the Minister would have been better served by placing this before that Commission rather than the public arena. 
Workers say accumulated sickies are a hard-fought right. Trades Hall has said if the government wants a fight, they're prepared to have one. Peter Ryan, NBN News.